Now, the monarch that has massacred Darwin's theory is not an earthly human monarch like the infamous Henry VIII, who had six wives. Or was it the eight wives of Henry VI? No, it was six wives of Henry VIII. And he lived in the day of sovereign monarchs. If you offended the king, he would simply say, off with his head, and it would indeed be done. Although he is a little more infamous for having said this on more than one occasion, off with her head. His wives who did not please him did not last very long. But as I said, it is not the power of an earthly potentate like Henry VIII that has massacred Darwin's theory. Rather, it is this monarch, the king of butterflies. This creature is very light, and it is delicate, yet it contains mountain loads of powerful evidence that have crushed the credibility right out of Darwin's theory. Now, how do the evolutionists explain amazing creatures like the monarch, its metamorphic cycle, its ability to navigate even over the op open ocean and see and find tiny islands it's never seen before on its migration to the southern hemisphere. Well, they explain it basically by denying the possibility that it could have been created. For example, Richard Dawkins, who is perhaps the most obnoxious and vociferous atheist evolutionist in the world today, uh, he said biology is the study of complicated things that give the appearance of having been designed for a purpose. Well, gee, if it appears to have been designed, maybe it's because it actually was. Well, he doesn't want to believe that because he's already committed to atheism. Worse yet, we have the Nobel laureate uh, Francis Crick, part of the Watson Crick team that got the Nobel Prize for correctly elucidating the double helical structure of DNA. He said biologists must constantly keep in mind that what they see was not designed, but rather evolved. So they've already made up their minds before they look at any evidence of design in nature. But what if, as with the monarch, it's a level of technology and design that outstrips anything in human engineering? We could not today in the 21st century with a dream team of the best engineers in the world and the trillions of dollars in the world's bank at their disposal. They could not make a ultra lightweight flying replica of a monarch with a pinhead sized brain or supercomputer that allows it to do what it can do. So we do see evidence of design that is really beyond human endeavor, therefore supernatural and superhuman, beyond what nature can do and beyond what our best human technology can achieve even thus far in the 21st century. Now Richard Dawkins again says, we have seen that living things are too improbable and too beautifully designed, quote unquote, to have come into existence by chance. Oh, so even the illusion of design, as he calls it, because real design is done by an intelligent designer, even the illusion of design is so complex it could not have happened by pure chance. Well, then we need a designer after all, don't we? Well, yes and no. He is willing to live with the kind of designer that he prefers, and he calls that designer the blind watchmaker. Now, why does he use that terminology? He's hearkening back to the old argument of William Paley in the 1800s. And William Paley basically said, if you're walking down a trail in the forest and you stub your toe and you reach down and pick it up and see what it was, and you find it's a gold pocket watch, and you open it up and look at the intricate cogs and wheels and the amazing design purposefully designed to deliver accurate time. William Paley said nobody in their right mind would say, well, I know how that got there. Some pine sap fell out of this here pine tree and chemically reacted with the soil and solar energy over centuries gave it the ability to turn into a gold pocket watch. He said no one would believe such a story because in all of the history of science and in all of history period, nobody has ever seen such a thing happen. We do see all the time, though, that an adequate cause, namely an intelligent watchmaker, can make a very complicated machine like a gold pocket watch. So he said the design in nature is far more complex than any machine man has ever made. And uh, they actually recognized that clear back in the early 1800s. And we know it much better today in the 21st century. We don't have uh, anything that can compare to what God has done, as we shall see with the monarch. Anyway. He said the blind watchmaker does it because that's another name for natural selection. Now, basically natural selection is therefore uh, epitomized as if it were a substitute creator 
a substitute designer. But I don't think it can compete with our great creator, Jesus Christ, because it's not just blind, it's also mindless and unconscious. You know, blind people can actually do some pretty amazing things because they still have conscious awareness and intelligence. I once heard a concert pianist who was totally blind and he played a perfect piano concerto. If I'd heard him on the radio, I would have had no idea he was blind. But because of conscious awareness and intelligence, he knew every key on the keyboard by touch and could play it masterfully. So that's something you can do even if you're impaired. But what if you're also mindless and unconscious? Imagine going to the emergency room and you've had terrible chest pains and you go in and they run some diagnostic analysis on you and they say, you know, you have a congenital heart defect and your heart's about to blow. If you don't get immediate corrective surgery within the next hour, you are going to die. Fortunately, we have a heart surgeon on staff here and here he comes and the double doors of the emergency room burst open and here comes the heart surgeon on a gurney and you look over at him and you notice that he is blind, mindless, and unconscious. This can mean only one thing. You are going to die, <laughs> okay? That kind of a heart surgeon can't help you, and neither can the pathetic so-called blind watchmaker of natural selection compete against the omniscient, omnipotent power of our great creator and savior, Jesus Christ. Now here we have DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid, and DNA is not life in and of itself. But as the famous French zoologist Pierre Paul Grasset said, it is the sine qua non of life. It is the most indispensable component. It carries the information that directs, like a blueprint, the growth and self-maintenance and eventual reproduction of living creatures. Life without DNA is unimaginable, but DNA is not the be-all, end-all. You need much, much more to work with it in a very complex, interdependent system irreducibly complex to the extreme. But could we even get DNA? Not that it's life in itself, but could we even get DNA by chance? Well, since we discovered the structure of DNA and its complexity and specificity back in the 20th century, that should have brought the creation evolution debate to a screeching halt. We can apply the proven laws of probability mathematics and determine that this could not be produced by chance uh, even in trillions times trillions of years. Now, conservatively, Getting a less than average sized DNA molecule of 1,000 nucleotide units, all correctly structured and bonded, excluding non-biological compounds that would have been in the primitive ocean, uh, and getting all right-handed deoxyribose sugars, you have to have left-handed amino acids and proteins, but right-handed deoxyribose sugars in DNA. The D in DNA stands for deoxyribose. The R in RNA stands for ribose sugar. And they have to be right-handed. So when we multiply these independent factors together conservatively, we could make it a lot worse and have good reason to do so, but conservatively, the odds of getting a less than average sized DNA molecule of only 1,000 nucleotide units with correct structure, correct uh, uh, dextrorotatory uh, enantiomers and the sugars, correct bonds and everything, it's only about one chance in 10 to the power of 2,200. That's the number one with 2,200 zeros after it. Now, is that a big number? Yes. How do we know? Well, it's bigger than the national debt under Obama. So, you know, it's got to be big. <laughs> okay. Of course, it's much bigger than that, and it's really incomprehensible to anyone, including myself, and I use big numbers all the time. One thing I like about mathematics is that, you know, it doesn't lie to me. Men lie all the time. It's in their nature to lie. God is so holy that he cannot lie. But men lie about as easily as they breathe, some more than others politicians in particular. You know, and I'm not saying all the politicians lie all the time. It's mainly just when their lips are moving. You gotta look out, they're probably lying to you, okay? Anyway, mathematics doesn't lie. And when we look at these odds, we find it is impossible to overcome. To give you a little perspective, if we were to take some of the smallest uh, subatomic particles, like electrons, which we don't know exactly how small they are, but a common estimate says that if you stack one on top of another an inch high in a single line, it would take about 2.5 quadrillion electrons. Counting them rapidly, uh, 250 per minute, day and night, 24 seven, it would only take about 19 million years to count the electrons that stack up to one inch. So those buggers are awfully small. Uh, now imagine how many electrons, protons, and neutrons exist in this auditorium, in the 
great state of Washington, in the Western Hemisphere, in the world, in the solar system, in the Milky Way galaxy, in the billions of galaxies in the known universe. Anybody have an estimate expressed as a logarithm to base 10? Well, scientists have taken a stab at it. They say it's approximately 10 to the power of 80, or the number one with 80 zeros after it. This number is one with 2,200 zeros after it. What does that mean in practical terms? Well, in practical terms, it means there ain't no way Jose. In uh, mathematical terms, we would say that this event could never transpire by chance anywhere in the universe in space or time because it is vastly beyond the threshold of impossibility established by the Borelian law of chance, which states that any event whose probability is extremely small will never occur anywhere in space and time. Emile Borel, the famous French probability mathematician, uh, set at the practical limit one chance in 10 to the power of 50, the number one with 50 zeros. This is the number one with 2,200 zeros. So in practical terms, it simply means if you had a trillion times a trillion times a trillion universes as big as ours, and every single atom in those trillion, trillion, trillion universes was replaced with a tiny DNA molecule of a thousand nucleotides, which was able to spontaneously break apart and randomly reassemble a trillion times per second. And it continued at that rate in those trillion, trillion, trillion universes for a trillion, trillion, trillion years. It would not even put a dent for all practical purposes in that number 10 to the power of 2,200. It simply could not be overcome. And if by some miracle you did happen to get one, it's helpless and hopeless and worthless by itself. It's just one part of a very complex, interdependent, irreducibly complex system known as a living cell. And if they did get it, well, it would simply decompose long before you could ever hope to get another one, according to the second law of thermodynamics. So it is indeed a hopeless predicament for them. But putting that aside, say they did get a cell, how are they going to get that single cell to evolve all the way up to, say, a marvelous monarch butterfly? Well, they claim that their blind watchmaker, the substitute creator, natural selection, coupled with mutation, will do the trick. Now, mutation simply means change, but it always means, in evolutionary terms, random, accidental, never intelligently guided change. It's always accidental without intelligent guidance. Now, we can check that out and see how well that works as far as producing new and better information. Now, does anybody recognize this sentence? This was used often in the old days as a drill when you were learning to type on an old typewriter, you know, before we had computer word processors. And you would type this over and over because it contains all 26 letters of the English language and was a basic drill to learn the basic keyboard of the typewriter. The quick brown fox jumped over the lazy dogs. Now, if random accidental typographical errors, which is what DNA is like, uh, usually done by copying errors during DNA replication, can also help uh, happen by mutagenic chemicals or radiation, but most often it's copying errors. And like when you're manually typing a manuscript, if you make mistakes, the more mistakes you make, the more you garble the information until you get too many mistakes, it simply becomes unintelligible and does not communicate worthwhile information anymore. So let's try this out with a little experiment. We'll have just three random mutations or typographical errors. We get the Dwick Brown Aox jumped over the last Eogs. Well, that didn't help too much. Maybe six random mistakes will do the trick. We get the Dwick Brosen Aox iumphed over the lost Eogs. Well, it sounds a little Swedish, perhaps. But I'll guarantee you there's no Swede that can read that. It doesn't make sense in any language with just six mistakes. That's why mutations, whenever they're large enough to really see the results, almost always result in blindness, disease, sterility, deformity, and death. It's a process that's far more likely to cripple you or kill you than it is to help you. But when you get rid of the word, the information that was eternal, the creator God, that's the best you've got to work with. And I don't think it makes any logical or scientific sense to point to that. Now, I love this analogy. We have this fellow sitting in his easy chair, throwing rocks at his old analog television set. And he says, maybe this next rock will mutate this analog set into a widescreen, high-definition TV. Oh, would that it were true. I have some old analog TVs. I'd love to just throw rocks at them and make them so much better. But even a child could tell you that damaging old parts does not turn them into new and superior parts of a new and better technology. The more you damage them, 
the more they become damaged until ultimately they turn into dust. Ashes to ashes, dust to dust. Such it is under the second law of thermodynamics. And random accidental occurrences only exacerbate that natural tendency toward disorder that we see in the world. So, to his credit, Theodosius Dobzhansky, the greatest evolutionist of the 20th century, he admitted that on the surface this appeared to be counterintuitive, or in other words, contrary to common sense. He admitted an accident, a random change in any delicate mechanism, can hardly be expected to improve it. Poking a stick in the machinery of one's watch or one's radio set will seldom make it work better. Indeed, if it's properly engineered, any random deviation from that correct engineering will make it work worse or not at all. And such is the nature of mutations. So the natural selection deception is stated thusly. Natural selection has no power to create new and better biological information. You notice it's not called the natural creator, just the natural selector. So if it's not the creator, what is the creative process in evolution? Ultimately, random accidental changes in DNA. Random mutations does the creating. Natural selection can't create anything. It only selects. But it has to select from more and more damaged and corrupted information. It can't select better information because random destructive accidents simply do not, in our scientific experience, produce new and better information on anything approaching the extreme scale it would take to take an amoeba all the way to a monarch or ultimately to a man. So natural selection has no power to create new and better biological information. Rather, it is wholly at the mercy of random destructive mutations to provide the necessary new information. Since random mutations cannot produce the needed results, natural selection is left helpless with nothing better to select. That's the death knell of it. It can't do any better than random mutations. Mathematics shows random mutations cannot and will not work. Now, let's apply this to the marvelous monarch butterfly, the king of butterflies. Why does the monarch deserve the title of monarch and king among the butterflies? I think there are at least seven good reasons. Number one, it lives longer than any other butterfly. Number two, it has a wider distribution over the earth than any other butterfly. Number three, it migrates further than any other butterfly. And uh, we'll see just how far that is. It's truly amazing, rivaling even some migrating birds. Number four, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> it is the most widely recognized butterfly in North America and probably in the world, considering how famous it is. Number five, it can navigate over the ocean beyond the sight of land, not just barely beyond the sight of land. It can go out over an ocean it's never seen before and hit tiny islands 1,500 miles away. In an ocean it's never seen, hitting islands it's never seen. That takes two, uh, true GPS level of precision navigation and it's been around for thousands of years before we ever developed it. Number six, it grows faster in proportion to starting in proportion to its starting weight than any creature in the animal kingdom. It can grow up to 3,000 times heavier than the little worm that hatches out of the little egg. And that is, as we shall see, very big indeed. Seventhly, it is adorned with a crown and jewelry that mimics the metallic shine of genuine gold. This is somewhat rare in nature, but I think it is fitting that the creator has given a golden crown and golden jewelry to the king of butterflies in its chrysalis stage. Now, metamorphosis is indeed an evolutionary enigma, a puzzle, a mystery. And metamorphosis, of course, is a compound Greek word that comes from meta, or change, and morphe, which means shape. And it is a fantastic changing not only of shape, but of function and of uh, everything, not just outside, but inside. Radical change. The problem is, why would evolution ever attempt such an incredibly difficult transformation when survival is at stake? Now, you have the uh, caterpillar, monarch caterpillar, and they're very susceptible to death by freezing. Cold temperature will kill them. They have to metamorphose into a butterfly that then migrates into the southern latitudes, most of them down to Mexico, uh, to keep from freezing. They have to eat, in the caterpillar stage, only milkweed. That's the only thing they can eat. And milkweed goes, grows in central North America, up as high as a little bit above the Canada border. And they come up, most of them, from Mexico, and you know, chase the blooming of the uh, milkweed. But 
The caterpillar obviously isn't going to be able to crawl down south to escape the cold and extinction. And you would think evolution would try to do the simplest thing. You know, it's hard with blind random destructive mutations to do anything. <laughs> but the simplest thing might be to, uh, you know, evolve some claws. So it could dig down in the ground, get deeper than the freezing level, hibernate during the winter, dig back up, eat milkweed up and down for tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of years until it evolves into a butterfly. There is, of course, another problem, isn't there? These caterpillars have no sexual organs. They don't have that until they're in the adult butterfly stage. So they can't reproduce. And even if they could crawl back and down, they would die before very long, long before they could evolve into a butterfly. So how did evolution solve this terrible problem threatening extinction? Well, it did something you'd never expect evolution to even attempt to do. The caterpillar encloses itself in a kind of a sarcophagus, a coffin or tomb of its own making, loses its eyes, retreats into darkness, and with enzymes, you know, chem chemical catalytic proteins, breaks down almost all of its internal organs and structures and even cell structure, and it turns it into a kind of a green fluid that has the basic biochemical building blocks, leaving only a few of the very important marginal cells that contain the DNA blueprint for this radical transformation. It has to know which cells to break down and which ones not to. And then, in as little as eight days sometimes, it transforms completely into a radically different kind of creature, different kind of digestive system, different type of eyes, different type of legs, different type of means of locomotion, able to navigate with GPS precision. Amazing. But evolution, you wouldn't think, would try something so difficult. Any one little thing goes wrong in this whole metamorphic process, and it fails. And anything that causes failure means extinction of the species. So survival of the fittest wouldn't hardly expect evolution to try something so radically difficult. And when you think about it, this is one of the greatest proofs of irreducible complexity. This whole thing had to be thought out and programmed in DNA blueprint with micromolecular machines capable of reading that language of DNA, translating it into a different language of proteins, and putting it all together. And if it wasn't already thought out, it wouldn't work. The DNA blueprint has to be there when it goes into this helpless, hopeless state that literally mimics death and partial decomposition in the grave. I mean, what survival value is there in you know, losing your eyes and turning yourself into a bunch of green fluid, for the most part, hoping that maybe some blind random destructive mutations will come along and give you the DNA blueprint to get you out of there and turn you into a butterfly so you can fly south before you freeze. I mean, it's absurd on the face of it. Evolution can't think ahead. It's blind. The blind watchmaker, as Richard Dawkins lo loves to point out, is not only blind, it's brainless and unconscious and cannot think ahead. But if this wasn't thought out with brilliance by a genius beyond genius who programmed it all and made every little facet work, monarchs would have been extinct a long time ago. Evolution simply cannot explain this miraculous transformation. I find it interesting when researching this, the evolutionists can't seem to refrain from using the word miraculous whenever they describe it. They don't believe in a miracle worker, but they call it miraculous nonetheless. Now, how does this start? The female monarch lays this tiny little egg, only about four one-hundredths of an inch in diameter, on the milkweed. And in her brief lifespan of anywhere from four to six weeks on the average, she can lay anywhere from two to four hundred of these eggs. These eggs are quite beautiful. They're glued on with a kind of biological superglue. Look kind of like a domed cathedral. And that tiny little egg, only about four one-hundredths of an inch in diameter, produces a tiny little monarch worm, or caterpillar, only about two millimeters long. It breaks out of the shell, immediately turns around, and starts eating the remnants of the eggshell, which provides it certain important nutrients. Then it starts eating the milkweed. Now, the interesting thing is that milkweed has a toxin in it, milkweed toxin. If you've ever tasted it, you have no doubt that it's toxic. <laughs> and the caterpillar actually eats that toxin, builds up immunity to it, and carries it with it the rest of its life, even in the butterfly stage. And that is to detour predators. And a predator that eats a monarch caterpillar or a monarch butterfly won't eat another one again, because it'll get very sick, vomited out, and I guess if it eat too many, it probably would kill them. But it tastes horrible. And that's there to defend the monarch. And in nature, when you see creatures displaying black 
outlines with bright colors in between. It's advertising like with neon lights. I'm poisonous. Don't mess with me or you'll wish you hadn't. It's not trying to camouflage like some creatures do. It's advertising that, hey, you don't want to mess with me. I'm poisonous. Well, the problem is that the monarch caterpillar has to gradually build up immunity to the milkweed toxin. If it eats too much at once, it can overdose and kill itself before it's hardly gotten started. So amazingly, they start eating toward the center of the leaf where there's much less milkweed toxin. Most of it's deployed at the edges of the leaf where most critters try to get a hold of it. It's much easier to eat at the edge than at the center. But this little caterpillar has the wisdom in its DNA somehow. I don't believe it came from a blind watchmaker. But it has the wisdom to go to the center and scuff, and it's difficult, but it finally starts making a hole in the center and eating there first. Now, the leaf detects the damage and starts uh, deploying the toxin from the edges down toward the center. But by that time, this creature has the wisdom to go out and start eating at the edges. So it gradually builds up its immunity, and it's all, all right. But just that lack of that proper instinct would have killed the thing right at the beginning. Now, it eats and molts and grows and grows until it somehow recognizes it has enough stored energy and uh, genetic material and, and uh, protein material that it can do this marvelous transformation of metamorphosis. And at this stage, it can weigh up to 3,000 times heavier than that tiny little worm that came out of that tiny little egg. To put this in perspective, we can relate to. It'd be like having a six-pound baby born, and in as little as 20 days, that baby would weigh 18,000 pounds, nine tons in 20 days. That's a real baby boomer. And the ultimate baby boomers are indeed the monarchs. Now, when it senses it has enough stored uh, chemical energy and nutrients and everything to do this transformation, it puts silk, one of the most complex things that creatures make. In fact, we can't even completely duplicate spider silk to this day, we wish we could, because we could make some wonderful bulletproof vests and things like that if we could. We can't quite seem to get the recipe right. But it's very complex glands that produce this silk. It's applied to the stem of the milkweed, and it uh, has a, its own little super glue. And then the caterpillar clasps onto it with claspers on its rear, and it hangs in a J shape, which I think is significant. J like Jesus, its creator. Now, when that happens, usually in about 12 hours or so, it's going to go through this metamorphic transformation. So you want to be ready the following day with your camera or a video, whatever you want to do. And this transformation has been documented to happen in as little as 60 seconds, although it usually takes at least several minutes. But again, everything has to be just right. Otherwise, it fails. And if it fails, it means extinction for these creatures. First of all, it changes from its J shape. It hangs down straight, it begins to gyrate, and it splits its skin just in the right place, right behind the back of its head there by its neck it begins to split simultaneously. If we could see what was going on inside, it would be mind-boggling. All these microscopic chemical machines breaking down some things, building up others, simultaneously transforming this thing from the inside out, just mind-boggling in its complexity. And as it continues to change and grow, the skin gets up here, it has to slough off. Problem is the claspers are attached to the skin. If the skin falls off with the claspers, this will fall to the ground. And if it falls to the ground at this stage, it will deform and not uh, be able to form properly. And that means, of course, death and extinction. So somehow it knew, <laughs> by blind random destructive mutations, that it has to have a little post called a cremaster, this little black post here. Okay? And it had to have that preformed and ready and the muscles ready to accurately push it up and it has little hooks on it, like Velcro, had to push it up blindly because it has no eyes at this you know, stage to aim. And it sticks it up with precision and hits that little patch of silk. If it went sideways, that's it. You fall to the ground, extinction. But it makes it remarkably accurately, hangs on there, continues its transformation by the mac uh, micromolecular machines until it gets the right form of the chrysalis. Again, if the chrysalis is deformed, the butterfly itself will be deformed. And if it can't migrate, it will die. So all of this has to be done exactly right, all thought out, programmed in the blueprint with very complex chemical machines that could read that information and do exactly what they're supposed to do in the right place at the right time, every time, or the consequence is death and extinction. I don't think blind random destructive mutations could pull that off. So it entombs itself in this coffin of its own making 
and breaks itself down, almost as if it has died and is decomposing in the grave, and then in as little as eight days, the number of new beginnings, it's able to take that basic chemical building blocks, which is primarily what's left, it does have those marginal cells with the right DNA to direct it, but it takes that basic chemical broth and puts it back from basic building materials into an entirely radically different type of creature, a beautiful creature, the king of butterflies, the monarch. Even then, it has to have the instinct programmed into it to break out properly. The chrysalis has to be formed correctly with creases in the back, so when it pushes with its legs, it'll split at the right place. If it didn't even have those creases, seemingly a, a minor innocuous thing, it wouldn't be able to break out of its own chrysalis and would die in a coffin of its own making. But the creases are there, and it does break out. It has to have the instinct to hang on for dear life, because at this point, you know, it has to pump fluid from its abdomen into its wings to make them unfold and deploy. And it's wet, it has to dry out, and this can take maybe 20 minutes to half an hour. If it falls to the ground while its wings are still wet and uh, crinkled up like that, it can do irreparable damage, it won't be able to fly, and again, if it doesn't fly, it can't migrate and it will die. So everything has to be perfect from the first time. It either all works together perfectly or it doesn't work at all. That type of foresight and making sure everything was thought out ahead of time simply cannot be done by blind random destructive mutations or by the blind, mindless, unconscious, so-called substitute designer of natural selection. So it is indeed not only an evolutionary enigma why such a complex process would even be attempted, much less reasonably achieved by evolution, but I think it's something God did on purpose to show that only he is the brilliant engineer who could pull off such an amazing trick, you know? Uh, it, it reminds me of what John F. Kennedy said when they were talking about putting a man on the moon in the early 1960s. And he challenged, you know, we want to put a man on the moon by the end of the decade. And he said, we choose to do these things not because they are easy, but because they are hard. And I think God chose to do this type of metamorphic process not because it's easy, but because it is so hard and requires everything to be perfect, first time, every time, irreducibly complex, thus showing the fingerprints of a master engineer, not the blind watchmaker. Furthermore, it also is a beautiful type and shadow that we see every spring and summer of the power of God to take a poisonous worm for all practical purposes and through death and resurrection, it becomes a royal heavenly creature instead of an earthbound, ugly, poisonous creature. Thus, a beautiful type and shadow of the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ to transform the life of the believer. Now we're going to look at monarch migration, which is truly a navigational nightmare for evolution. <coughs> Excuse me. In this regard, I'm going to quote uh, Jules H. Poirier, who is an aerospace navigational engineer, and he wrote an excellent book on this topic called From Darkness to Light to Flight, Monarch the Miracle Butterfly. I don't know if they have that back there, but you could get it off, I'm sure, one of the creationist websites. Now, being a creationist scientist in uh, applied science, engineering, he knew how hard it was to make navigational equipment that actually works, you know, for airplanes and for space vehicles. And the smaller you make them, orders of magnitude more difficult in making them actually work. So he was fascinated by this aerial vehicle that's so tiny and so lightweight that can do such stupendous things. So he studied it and he wrote this book, and later he records in this book that he was given an opportunity to lecture to his fellow uh, engineers because their engineering company wanted them to develop better public speaking skills so if the media came in, you know, they'd give a good account of the company. So he chose to challenge his fellow engineers in his speech to produce a working, very lightweight, very tiny micro aerial vehicle that could fit these design specifications. Now, he didn't tell them that they were trying to match the capabilities of the monarch butterfly. He just said, I challenge you to make this type of extremely lightweight and capable micro self-navigating aerial vehicle. So his challenge to his fellow engineers was thus, design and build the following optical lens and electrical navigation system. Oops. Requirements for the lens system the lens system must be able to see in all directions simultaneously. The lens system must be capable of seeing all the colors of the rainbow and also ultraviolet light and detect the polarization of sunlight. The lens system must detect objects as small as 0.04 inches in diameter to as large as 10 feet uh, from distances of as little as one inch 
to as much as 20 feet away. The light from the lens system must be converted into electrical voltage pulses whose magnitudes shall be proportional to the light intensity, a maximum amplitude or voltage of only 20 millivolts, delivered to a central computer, which by the way can be no bigger than the head of a pin, via an electrical network system containing no more than 72,000 paths. The electrical pulses must have a discernible value even when the light intensity is only that of a full moon. The central computer must be capable of translating as many as 72,000 electrical voltage pulses into a meaningful image. Requirements for the navigation system. You'll see the requirements keep getting harder and harder. Sensors must be provided to detect the direction of the Earth's magnetic field and the position of the sun. The central computer must be able from an input of information on the sun's position and the Earth's magnetic field to determine its present location to an accuracy of plus or minus 100 feet or basically to duplicate a GPS level of navigation precision without using GPS satellites. Number three, the computer must be capable of directing its navigation pilot, which is a mechanical autopilot, to a new location that it's never seen before, as far away as 3,000 miles, the equivalent of 5,000 kilometers, to an accuracy of plus or minus 100 feet. It must also be able to navigate over the ocean, beyond the side of land, in excess uh, or up to 1,500 kilometers over an ocean it's never seen and hit tiny islands it has never seen before. Other requirements. Now it starts to get really difficult. The system must be designed to weigh less than 0.5 grams. That does it there. We can make such systems, we cannot make them as tiny as what we find in the monarch butterfly. The system in its entirety must be smaller than a pea. The system must be designed to be built in eight days by one person in total darkness using mostly basic raw materials and very few prefabricated parts. That's what the monarch does. It loses its eyes, it's blind, it's in darkness, it tears itself apart, and then it builds itself up using basically biochemical raw materials for the most part. Finally, the system must have the capability to continually reproduce itself several times per year for at least several thousand years while maintaining sufficient quality control so its navigation equipment can still accomplish the precision mission requirements. This puts it light years beyond anything human technology has been able to achieve. We can't make any machine that is self-diagnosing, self-repairing, self-maintaining, and self-reproducing, able to extract from the environment all that it needs to keep reproducing itself for thousands of years with incredibly high fidelity. We can't make any machine capable of autonomous self-replication. The tiniest bacterium can do it, but we can't make anything like that. This has the fingerprints of God all over it. It is beyond our 21st century technology. Now at this point, his fellow engineers were practically rolling in the aisles. They said, you know, why don't you ask for the moon? You know, I mean, this is ridiculous. No engineer in the world could make such an incredible machine. And he said, well, I'm here to tell you that somebody has because there is one in operation by the millions and they've been operating it with all these design specifications for thousands of years. It happens to be the monarch butterfly. And those engineers got a whole new perspective on what is capable to be done by God as compared to what is capable to be done by man. For as the scripture says, with man this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. Now, in the monarch's migration in North America, we find that they have to get down to the southern latitude so they don't freeze. They have to overwinter there, waiting for the spring and the milkweed to sprout again. And we find that they fly up from uh, Southern California and Baja Peninsula up on the uh, west side of the Rocky Mountains. They go about as high as up here, about up where we are here, uh, Oregon, Washington. We also have them going, the largest amounts of them going up in Central North America, Central United States. The furthest ones go clear up here to this bay uh, by Nova Scotia and New Brunswick. Those are the ones that fly the furthest, a good 5,000 kilometers, about 3,000 miles to get down to the main overwintering ground, which is in Mexico. One of the biggest ones is about 200 miles west of the Neovolcanic Mountains. Now, it used to be we had upwards of 300 million monarchs migrating annually. 
Uh, in some places, they'd practically blot out the sun. There were so many of them flying in the sky at the same time. But like the bees, we've had a tremendous die-off on monarchs uh, up to about 90%, they estimate. So instead of 300 million migrating, perhaps there's only 30 million. I know when I was a kid, they were all over the place. You know, you could go out, everybody had them in their homes, you'd watch them in the jars doing their metamorphosis. We had them at school. They were just all over the place, and now you can't hardly see them at all unless you're in the right place. There aren't that many left, unfortunately. So uh, recently, there was some kind of a lawsuit about some insecticide that's being used that wasn't properly tested and may be causing a lot of damage both to our bees and our monarchs. But anyway, the point is, they have to migrate up there, but when they go, especially on this long trip all the way up here, you know, 5,000 kilometers away from their overwintering grounds, how are they going to get back in time? With an average lifespan of only, you know, uh, maybe about five weeks on the average, they're not going to be able to make it all the way back and then overwinter for several months, waiting for the spring and waiting for the new crop of milkweed. They're going to die of old age. But this generation, and it takes about four generations to get up this high, that fourth generation is called the Methuselah generation because instead of living only four to six weeks on the average, it will live up to eight months. Some of them, they've documented up to a year, but at least eight months, giving them plenty of time to fly back and to spend a few months overwintering and have enough lifespan left to then fly up again and lay their eggs on the new crop of milkweed to perpetuate the species. If that one little thing wasn't in the DNA, they all would have gone extinct a long time ago. They simply wouldn't live long enough to be able to over, overwinter at all. So on their way back, we find that these, sometimes, usually they go overland down to the Neovolcanic Mountains. Sometimes they'll come right across the Gulf of Mexico. Now remember, that's a new generation, that fourth generation. They've never made this trip before. How do they know where to go? How can they navigate so precisely? How do they know when they go over the Gulf of Mexico beyond the side of land that it's not a huge ocean like the Pacific that goes on for thousands of miles and they're going to run out of fuel and drown? Somehow they seem to have a GPS-like biological map that tells them you're on course, it's okay, there is land there, you've never seen it before, but they know it's there. Somebody put that map in them and I don't think it was blind random destructive mutations. Now, at the Neovolcanic Mountains, if you ever get a chance to be down there when the monarchs are coming in, it is one of the most amazing spectacles and pageantry of color and motion, just fantastic. And these keep coming in by the millions, and they will come in more and more and more, and they'll cluster together, because it is high altitude, it gets cool at night, and they want to conserve their body temperature, so they'll cluster together closer and closer until some of these large trees actually get completely covered with monarchs, and some of the large ones, they estimate, contain up to 100,000 monarchs per tree. Amazing indeed. What's especially amazing is that by painstakingly following these generations and uh, you know, putting a little tag on their wings with a serial number, they've been able to prove that that fourth generation can come back some 5,000 kilometers and not just get within 100 feet of the tree where their great-great-grandparents left, but can actually go to exactly the same tree, having thus even greater accuracy than our standard GPS. Now here we have a satellite map <clears throat> of North America. Can anybody tell me on this map the location of the Bermuda Islands? Some may say, well, I've never been there before. Well, the monarchs haven't either. You know, they go boldly where no monarch has gone before, <laughs> over an ocean they've never seen, trying to catch tiny islands they've never seen before. Well, we'll have a close-up. Can you see them now? They're so tiny that they're very difficult to see from outer space. But if you look at the bottom of this red arrow right there, there they are, kind of hard to see. Tiny little Bermuda Islands. Remember, they have to leave from this bay up here, fly about 13 and a half, uh, 1,350 kilometers nonstop over the ocean. They can't stop, you know, and drown. And they do use winds to help them, but it appears that they apparently have ability to navigate even at night. You know, all weather pilot's license, you know, where you can fly both day, day and night. You really got to know your stuff to do that, but apparently they can because their maximum uh, rate of, of flight is only about 15 miles an hour, and they can't maintain that all the way. They do use winds to help them, but they'd have to have like hurricane force winds uh, to get them there in nothing but daylight. So although it is true that the ones that go overland migrate pretty uh, leisurely, about 50 miles a day average, the ones that take off here go nonstop from this bay, 13 and a half uh, 
100 kilometers <clears throat> and hit with precision those islands that somehow they know are there. So they take off here nonstop, get to the Bermuda Islands, then they change direction and they fly nearly 1,500 kilometers this time to these islands down here. Anybody know what those islands are? Those are the Bahamas. They fill up on nectar as their fuel and they take off from there and they go to Cuba. Now the monarchs were created by God so they are conservative and they don't really like to spend a lot of time in communist Cuba. Uh, so they fill up on nectar and they get out of Dodge and they go here, much nicer place, Jamaica. Fill up on nectar there and then fly directly across the ocean to their overwintering grounds, which in this case is at the base of the Yucatan Peninsula in the country of Guatemala. This zigzag pattern shows that they actually know where these islands are and can locate them with precision. It's not just a simple compass setting. They actually know what direction to go and what direction to go back to. Uh, somebody put that amazing geographical data in their DNA. So what are the secrets of the monarch's navigation capabilities? Well, for one thing, these amazing compound eyes that can see in 360 degrees simultaneously also can detect the polarization of sunlight, which means if it's a totally cloudy day and you only have one patch of blue, they're able to determine from the polarized sunlight an accurate location of the sun. Where is the sun? Is it here? Is it here? Is it over here? Well, when you're trying to use astronomical computations to determine navigation, you better have it right. Well, the monarch, of course, knows even on a cloudy day the sun is there. That's if it has at least a window of blue sky. It's able to determine that. On more clear weather, it makes more precise calculations using the equivalent of a sextant. We know that they have these tiny little precision slits in their antenna that's able to accurately measure the angle of the sun above the horizon. In addition to that, of course, you also have to have the correct dates because the position of the sun and the azimuth of the horizon and how, hard, how high it rises above the horizon has a lot to do with where you are in the world and what season it is in the world. And that, of course, has to be run through data in a navigator's almanac, which, by the way, changes every year. <laughs> they automatically update. You know, we've heard about that with our computers. This amazing pinhead-sized supercomputer somehow automatically updates and has all this navigational data. Now, that's good for determining latitude, but you also have to determine longitude, something that's not that easy to do. Back in the days of sail ships, they had all kinds of trouble because if you have accurate clocks that give you the time where you are compared to the time at the standard meridian or zero longitude, you can run a mathematical calculation to determine your longitude. But back in those days, they had pendulum clocks, like the grandfather clock, which you put on a rocking, rolling ship, and it doesn't work. So they had to develop the spiral watch spring in a marine chronometer that was impervious to the rocking and rolling of the ship. So if you have a clock giving you accurate local time, and you compare it with the clock at Zulu time, as it's called in the military, or the time at uh, Greenwich, England, where the prime meridian, zero longitude, runs right through that. That was established back in the days of uh, sail ships when uh, England was the maritime power of the world. So you have to take these two clocks, uh, and then you subtract to find the difference in minutes between the two. Then you divide that number by a certain number to determine your longitude. Does anybody know what number you divide by? Well, I'm sorry, you're all going to get lost and drown at sea. Too bad, so sad. If you're a monarch, you don't have to worry. That little pinhead-sized supercomputer keeps those clocks running and has kept them running with precision for thousands of years. In addition to that, though, you need other things. All of this is nice, but it's not enough. You need something if it's totally cloudy or foggy, and it does have a magnetic compass to back itself up in those situations until the sun comes back up and it can make even more accurate astronomical calculations. But even all of this equipment, and somehow having the innate instinctual ability to use it properly, is not enough. It has to be used in conjunction with something else, or it's basically worthless. What is that? Well, it happens to be an accurate map of the Earth. You see, if you have a map of the Earth that says the Bermuda Islands are over here at this longitude and latitude, but in fact, they're over here, you can run the data and get the correct longitude and latitude and try to hit the target, but you get there and there's nothing there. What's the problem? The map you're using is inaccurate. I don't think this super accurate map got into their DNA by a bunch of blind, random, destructive mutations, and it either all works together or it doesn't work at all, first time, every time, or they go extinct. Now, to put this in perspective, how well could you navigate if you were treated like a monarch? You know, you travel someplace you've never been before, you're in a coffin, 
you come out of the coffin like a vampire, except you're not a vampire, say you can fly, and you know you have to migrate over this ocean you've never seen before, hitting tiny islands you've never seen before, and you know that you only have limited fuel, but you have to determine your navigation. So you remember that in Boy Scouts, they told you the sun rises in the east and sets in the west. And at night, you can see Polaris, the North Star, off the rim of the Big Dipper, you know, so you can determine true north. Uh, but what if it's cloudy or foggy? Well, by golly, last time you had a box of Cracker Jacks, you had the presence of mind to retain the toy, which turned out to be a magnetic compass. Ah, so now you can determine north, south, east, and west, even in cloudy and foggy weather. You get ready to take off, and all of a sudden, it dawns on you. You don't know exactly where you are. You know maybe that you're somewhere in North America on the eastern seaboard, but you need to know exactly where you are in order to take off on the right angle of trajectory to intercept the target. You see, because the angle would be different depending on what location you're in on the map, different angles for different places. So you have to determine true longitude and latitude where you are, determine the true longitude and latitude of the target with hopefully an accurate map, and then constantly keep recalibrating to correct for wind drift, because when you're a butterfly, boy, wind really affects you a lot. You can use it as a tailwind, but there's never a true tailwind that takes you exactly where you want to go. You constantly have to take astronomical calculations, course correct, otherwise you die. Again, it is amazing that these tiny creatures can do this, and we cannot make an aerial vehicle that small that can do it. As Jules Poirier, the engineer, points out, it would be extremely difficult for humans to duplicate the navigational achievements of monarch butterflies. Human navigators would require a clock, a sextant, a current astronomical almanac, a compass, and a current magnetic map of the region. Even with these instruments, they would require a high level of observational skill and computational ability to travel some 3,600 kilometers across a continent between specific locations, even much more so when they're traveling over 5,000 kilometers over an open ocean they have never seen and hopscotching to tiny islands they've never seen before. So recognizing design, is there a double standard? I believe so. On the left, we have the recent prototype of the Harvard Microbotic Fly. Boy, it took millions of dollars to make this thing, and they're so proud because they can actually get it to hover without crashing, you know, and they can make it veer left or veer right on command. Wow, millions of dollars of our tax money for that. But at least it meets the weight requirements to match the lightweight nature of the monarch. But as you can see, they cheat a little. There's these little copper wires there. That means it has an off-board power source. If we had to put a battery on it, it might not even be able to take off. And even if it could, its flight endurance would be greatly limited. Monarch can fly, documented, about 1,500 kilometers nonstop over an ocean it's never seen and hit with precision the target it's trying to intercept. This thing, you can't even put a GPS computer on it if you wanted to. We can't make them that small. So it can't begin to compete with the monarch. We have to get a little bit bigger. Here we have a very popular handheld, hand-launched uh, surveillance vehicle, micro-aerial vehicle, and it's called the Raven. Military uses it. It has to have a laptop computer to program it. And it's a lot bigger than the monarch, big enough to have a GPS computer on board. But its main problem is it can't compete with the monarch because of very limited flight endurance. It can only go about a 12-mile round trip. So it goes over the hill there about six miles away with his camera, sees what the enemy is doing, has to turn around and come right back or it'll run out of power and crash. The Monarch navigates every bit as accurately as that GPS, but it can go 1,500 kilometers nonstop and refuel, locate refueling stations and refuel itself automatically, if you look at it that way. So we have to get a lot bigger like this, the Tomahawk cruise missile. This thing weighs 2,900 pounds. Wow a lot more than the Monarch, which weighs a tiny fraction of one ounce. But it can go, most of them, about 1,000 miles and hit within 30 feet of the intended target by GPS navigation. But we can ask some interesting questions. Which is more complex? Again, we can't make any machine capable of autonomous self-maintenance, self-repair, and especially self-reproduction, like the Monarch. It'd be wonderful if we could make Mama and Daddy cruise missile and they'd get together and have baby cruise missiles that would grow up to adults and they'd have their own baby cruise missiles and we could breed them like rabbits and we wouldn't have to pay these high paid technicians a million to three million dollars a piece to make these things on the assembly line. But we can't do that. Nothing can match God's ability to make completely autonomous, self-replicating 
machines of life. So it doesn't win in that category. What about reliability? Well, here again, uh, the monarch has been self-reproducing, self-maintaining, self-healing, self-navigating for thousands of years. Can man make any mechanical device that will last and work and reproduce itself for thousands of years without any outside help and maintenance? You know, our best military aircraft today, F-15 Eagle, F-22 Raptor, top, you know, dogfighters in the world, for every hour of flight, they have to have a minimum of about 12 hours ground time for inspection, maintenance, and repair. That's why they can never put the whole fleet out at once unless they don't want to have any to use for a while, because when they get back, there has to be a lot of intensive inspection, maintenance, and repair. These things have been doing this on their own for thousands of years. There's just no comparison between what God can make and what man makes. Finally, we can ask the question, which was designed and which happened by chance? Well, ironically, the evolutionists will point to this and say, boy, we're so proud we can take out terrorists across the world with our GPS navigating cruise missiles and drones and everything else. Yeah, if the GPS works, which a lot of time, believe me, it does not. I've, I've used it many years. I just about want to throw the thing out the window sometimes. But this thing navigates beautifully. It's not based on flimsy GPS. You know, if there's a war, they can shoot down our GPS satellites with anti-satellite uh, missiles. Uh, they can use electromagnetic pulse to knock them out as a weapon. Just a big flare or massive coronal ejection from the sun will wipe out our satellites. Goodbye to GPS. What will it do to the monarch? Nothing. It will still be able to navigate with precision because it doesn't have a navigation system based on our flimsy human GPS. Finally, when we look at Darwin's confession in his famous book on the origin of species, he admitted if it could be demonstrated that any complex organ existed, which could not possibly have been formed by numerous successive slight modifications, my theory would absolutely break down. When we compare that to the monarch butterfly, I think it does break down. He also said concerning instincts, many instincts are so wonderful that their development will probably appear to the reader a difficulty to sufficient, sufficient to overthrow my whole theory. Well, I would say amen, Brother Charlie. I think it does overthrow your whole theory. Because remember, you have this irreducible complexity that has to be there first time every time to perfection or it can't even exist and reproduce. And it has to have navigational uh, precision first time or it'll get lost and die. And again, this type of instinct, this type of irreducible complexity is only known by intelligent design. But this reflects a level of intelligent design that is indeed supernatural and superhuman beyond what natural forces could achieve beyond what the best human technology can achieve even in the 21st century. Finally, I close with some penetrating questions. Why did God create the monarch butterfly? I would suggest there are two major reasons. Number one, to teach us of God's attributes. As it says in Job chapter 12, but now ask the beasts and they will teach you and the birds of the air and they will tell you and the fish of the sea will explain to you who among all these does not know that the hand of the Lord has done this? He's basically saying if God gave a voice to speak like he did to Balaam's donkey, they wouldn't say, oh, praise Darwin, praise the blind watchmaker, praise evolution. They would say, we are fearfully and wonderfully made by the hand of the Lord, which is obvious. And the most fearfully and wonderfully made creature of all are those made in the very image of God, human beings. As it says in Romans chapter 1, verse 20, for ever since the creation of the world, his invisible nature and attributes, that is, his eternal power and divinity, have been made intelligible and clearly discernible in and through the things that have been made. His handiworks. Today we've looked at just one of his marvelous handiworks, the marvelous, majestic monarch butterfly. So men are without excuse, altogether without any defense or justification, if they say it happened by chance without a creator. Secondly, why did God create the monarch butterfly? To give us a beautiful illustration of his power to cause miraculous transformation from spiritual death and physical death to life everlasting. As it says in 2 Corinthians 5.17, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. This first, of course, happens spiritually. Our spiritual man is transformed. We look the same on the outside. We still get old and look worse as time goes on. The outward man decays away, but the inward man is renewed day by day. But to give us that new spiritual birth cost a lot. It cost God the gift to the bankrupt heaven, the gift of his son to die in our place and to pay the penalty of sin, which is death. 
Now, Job, in Job chapter 25, asked this very important question. He said, how then can man be righteous before God? Or how can he be pure who is born of a woman? If even the moon does not shine and the stars are not pure in his sight, how much less man who is a maggot and a son of man who is a worm? You know, what, what is the scripture getting at here? Man is said to be made in the image of God. That's pretty high and lofty and noble, not like a maggot. And man is just a little bit lower than the angels, but in our redeemed state, we will judge the angels. We'll be the queen of heaven, so to speak, the bride of Christ, co-regent with him, sitting in his throne, governing the universe. Wow, that's, that's even higher than the angels in our redeemed state. But what's being got at here is that man is now a fallen, wretched sinner. Man has so missed what God intended for him, and he's in a hopeless, terrible, poisonous state, poisoned with sin that will eventually kill us for eternity if we don't get the antidote. The only problem was the antidote was incredibly expensive. A king's ransom, where the king of the universe, the creator himself, had to humble himself and rescue us out of this terrible, hopeless state of bondage to sin that we are in. And it's interesting, in Psalm 22, where King David, a thousand years before the time of Christ, spoke about the crucifixion of Christ, and the crucifixion hadn't even been invented at that time as a means of execution. But his words graphically portrayed what happened to Christ. In fact, the first words of Psalm 22 were the very words spoken by Christ on the cross, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? But in the spirit of prophecy, King David said something else that a lot of people overlook. He said this, but I am a worm and not a man. Speaking of Christ who humbled himself, not just lower than the angels, but also became that vile worm that had to consume our sin, sin that wasn't his to consume. But it says he himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree. And I, I don't know how God did this, but it says he who knew no sin was made to be sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. He is so high and lofty the high and lofty one who inhabits eternity, transcendent above space and time. He is so magnificent, and yet he is so humble that he would humble himself to the ultimate degree, the lowest of the low, becoming that vile maggot, squirming in the filth of human sin and ingesting it to his own death. You know, the monarch caterpillar eats milkweed toxin to protect itself from predators. But Jesus ate the toxin of our sin, not to protect himself. He died because of it but to protect us from predation by sin and Satan forever. He became the lowest of the low. He died the most vile death. He went into a tomb voluntarily for three days. He didn't have any man take it from him. He said, I lay my life down that I might take it up again. No man takes my life. And on the third day, he rose with a glorious eternal resurrection body, the first fruits meaning that we also will have a resurrection body like his that will never get old or sick or die, a body suitable for the new heaven and new earth promised, where there's no more sorrow, no more sickness, no more pain, no more tears, no more curse, and no more death, for the last enemy has been destroyed by God Almighty, our Creator, who is willing to partake of our sin and taste of death for every one of us, because we are that important to him. So as it says in Philippians 3.21, Christ shall change our vile body that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. For with God, all things are possible. All you have to do is look at the marvelous metamorphic life cycle of the monarch. It's a miracle and God has put it there as a type and shadow. What God can do for the monarch butterfly, he can do for us. But when he does it for us, it's far more significant, and the blessing of it is everlasting. That's the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ and his life-transforming power seen every year in the marvelous life cycle of the monarch butterfly.